Hello everyone, my name is Joseph Elfeld and I'm the developer of GIS Surfer. One of the features under the menu button is called screenshot mode. The main reason I added this feature is so that users can make their own custom maps that work offline on both iOS and Android devices. Each map can cover a huge area, have plenty of detail, and show almost any information that GIS Surfer can display. In order to demonstrate this feature, I need to have my browser in full screen mode. However, that is not the screen ratio that YouTube prefers. As a result, you will see some black areas around the edge of your screen and there's nothing I can do about that. Now, I expect just about everyone watching this video knows how to take a screenshot. However, the GIS Surfer screenshot mode has some special features. When GIS Surfer is in screenshot mode, the user interface is not on the screen. The screen is all map. And after you take a screenshot, you can shift the screen exactly one screen worth up, down, left, right. To the best of my knowledge, that is a unique feature in GIS Surfer. And since the screenshots exactly adjoin, it's super easy to stitch them together and make a single larger image. And when you're done with taking a series of screenshots, GIS Surfer provides all of the geo-reference data for your screenshots. Now, in addition to this video, there's also a PDF tutorial on the same topic. That PDF has additional tips and details that are not in the video. To find that PDF file, browse to GISSurfer.com. That's the home page. It's on the screen right now. Go down to the lower right corner, click the big green menu button, and then go and click on the help link. And the help page will show up. And here are links to the videos. And below that are links to the PDF files. And this one right there is the additional detail on screenshot feature. So what can you do with this screenshot feature? Well, after stitching some screenshots together, you can take that larger JPEG to your local copy store and they can make a nice, really large print. But to me, the real benefit of this feature comes when you make use of the georeference data. And for anyone not familiar with that term, when an image is georeferenced, it means that you know the latitude and longitude for the four edges of the image. The image you are seeing on the screen right now was made by stitching together 15 screenshots. As part of using screenshot mode, GIS Surfer produced the latitude and longitude for the four edges of the stitched together image. You will see an example of doing that later in this video. And now you are seeing the same image opened with GIS Surfer. The stitched together image is outlined in red. If you zoom in on the edge of the image anywhere, you will see that the georeferenced image is exactly in the right position because everything lines up with the underlying base map. And you can also see that there's plenty of detail on the stitched together image for these trails here. You could easily use this map to hike around on these trails, turn on a geolocation feature, and see where you are at. Now I'm going to click Menu, Link to this map, and I'm going to expand this window here so I can show you the link and the link includes the data parameter right there and the data parameter is used to display information on the map and so you see I made a name for the georeferenced image right there and that's followed by the address to where the stitched together image is hosted on my server Okay, see if I can hi highlight that right there. There's the JPEG. And that is followed by the georeference data, which again is the latitude longitude for the four edges of the image. And that starts with the latitude for the south edge of the image and goes around the image in a clockwise direction. And there is both a video and a PDF tutorial on the data parameter showing how to, how to use that, including how to display geo-referenced images. 
Now, earlier in the video, I mentioned that screenshot mode can be used to make geo-referenced images. It can be displayed as offline maps. I'm writing code for a second web map called GeoJPEG. The maps that GeoJPEG can display are any geo-referenced images, including the stitched together images you can make from GIS Surfer screenshot mode. GeoJPEG is a progressive web app, or PWA, and will work offline on both iOS and Android devices. In other words, users will be able to make their own custom maps that work offline and show almost anything that GIS Surfer can display. And in addition to using these georeferenced images as GeoJPEG maps, there are also other uses, including 3D, which I will describe near the end of this video. The screen is now showing the default GIS Surfer map. I'm going to take a series of screenshots that show trails and roads in the National Forest. So I'm clicking Menu, Recreation Maps, scrolling down a little bit here. There are several map links that you can use here to make your own screenshots, or of course you could make your own GIS Surfer map that shows some other data and then take screenshots. So I'm going to scroll down to the National Forest Maps and take this second one here and open that up. This map highlights trails, roads, various other recreation features in all of the National Forest. When it opens up it shows a popular hiking area in the Cascade Mountains near Seattle and I have hiked on these trails a bunch. You can zoom out and then pan this map to other National Forest land or use Menu Search to move the map to your area. Various GIS layers are turned on and some of the data is restyled so it is easier to see on any base map. And notice the scale down in the lower right corner is set to 2,000 feet. I find that scale gives plenty of detail when I'm making the screenshots. I'm going to click the Base Map button and show you the overlays that are turned on when the map opens. And those are the overlays that have a number in front of them. Sometimes when I'm doing this, I might turn off, for example, the landform names. I might turn that one off. Another one I turn off sometimes is the All Stream River and Lake one. You can experiment with that a little bit and decide if you're going to make screenshots of National Forest Land, which of these overlay layers you want on and what you want off, but just remember that the appearance of the map can be affected a great deal by the order with which you turn the overlays on. Now, you can make geo-referenced images with just about any device that has a browser that can open GIS Surfer. But with that said, I recommend that you use the largest screen that you have available since each screenshot will cover a larger area. Also, I'm making this video using a Windows 10 PC with a mouse and keyboard. If you are using a touch screen, then the workflow is the same, but some of the interface is different. Those differences are described in the PDF tutorial for making geo-referenced images. Now, before you start taking screenshots, I recommend you make a folder where you can save your work, and I've already done that. Also, to save the screenshots, I'm going to use the 2D version of Windows Paint, and I have that program open as well. Now, while I could move this map to anywhere in the National Forest System before I start taking screenshots, for the purpose of this video, I'm just going to start with the image on the screen right, right here. And I'm going to take a series of four screenshots that are in a grid, two across and two screenshots down. You can take screenshots in any order. Personally, I always start by taking a screenshot that will go in the upper left corner of the stitched together image. And then I work from left to right, finish the screenshots for the first row, and I go down to the next row and take those screenshots left to right again. And here's an important tip for assigning file names to your screenshot. I recommend naming your screenshots in the manner shown on the screen. The first number is the row and the second number is the column. So the screenshot for the first one in the upper left corner is one underline one. The last screenshot is going to be row two, column two, so it's two underline two. 
This naming convention shows where the images go as I stitch them together, and if a certain screenshot needs to be redone, it is a simple matter to open the original map link, use the arrow keys to move the screen to the correct position, and redo a single screenshot. Now the screen is showing the map again, and notice that the coordinates for the center of the map end in 43 and 76. So I'm going to type F11 to shift the browser into full screen mode. And I'm going to type F11 a second time to come back out of full screen mode. Notice what happened. The coordinates for the center of the screen change a slight amount. They now end in 29 and 18. Typing F11 twice before you go into screenshot mode is really important if you ever want to replicate this exact map or any one of the screenshots. Next, I am clicking F11 again to put the browser back into full screen mode using the Tweak Map Center. Now click Menu, Screenshot Mode. There's a question here about are you using a touch screen? But the first time you get here, I really encourage you to click on Read Me. Now this is the same screen, but it just displays some useful reminders and tips. When you are finished with the reading through this information, you'll get back down to the question about whether you are using a touch screen or not. Note that if you use a Mac computer, then the steps I'm about to run through will not work for you. Instead, there are special instructions for Mac users in the PDF tutorial on georeferencing. Those instructions will show a Mac user how to simulate using a touch screen. To find a link to that PDF, open GISurfer.com, click the big green menu button, then click help and scroll down a bit. I'm using a Windows 10 PC with a keyboard. I'm going to click no and finally click ready to take screenshots. Now notice that the screen is 100% map. There's no user interface on here anywhere. I'm going to take a screenshot by holding down the Alt key and tapping Print Screen. Now to save the screenshot, I'm going to hold down the Alt key and hit the Tab key. Now if the active box was not on the Paint Program, I would use my arrow keys to move it, the active box to the Paint Program. And now I'm going to hit Paste and Paste again. Now, there's the screenshot I just made. Now I'm going to click File, Save As, JPEG, and I'm going to navigate to the folder that I made where I'm going to save the screenshot. So we're going to go there, and here's the uh, folder that I made. So I'm going to paste it in there. And I'm going to use the naming convention that I described. So this file name is going to be 1, underline 1. So the screenshot is in row one, column one, and save it. Now, to get back to the map, I'm going to do Alt, Tab, and I'm back to the map. Now I'm going to tap the right arrow key, or the letter R, to shift the screen exactly one screen worth to the right. And now do Alt, Print Screen, Alt, Tab, I'm back in the Paint program, do Paste, Paste, and File, Save As, JPEG, and this one is going to be file name 1, underline 2. Get rid of that, save that, do Alt, Tab, and I'm back to the map. Now I need to move the screen back to column 1 and down to the next row. So I'm pressing the left arrow key or the letter L, to move the screen exactly one screen worth to the left. And then press the down arrow key, or the letter D, to move the screen exactly one screen worth down. Now here's a tip. As I shift the screen left, I count down the columns. So if the last screenshot was in column 5, then as I press the left arrow key, I will count down 4, 3, two, one. And this helps me stay focused during the repetitive task of taking multiple screenshots. I paused recording while I took the last two screenshots 
and save them as 2 underline 1 dot jpeg and 2 underline 2 dot jpeg. Now I'm hitting the escape key to get out of screenshot mode and I'm hitting the F11 key to get my browser out of full screen mode. Now each of the four buttons that you see here will load the georeference data plus some other information to the clipboard and from there you can save it. Since I'm going to stitch the four JPEGs together, I only need to save the georeference data for stitching. So I'm going to click the first button right there. That data is copied to the clipboard. Now I'm going to go over to my editor. I already have an empty file open and I'm going to paste the clipboard content right in there. Well, one of the things that was saved was the link that will reopen the map at the exact place where I took the first screenshot. And there's the last two digits of the latitude and, lo latitude and longitude that were tweaked by doing F11 twice before starting to take the screenshots. And here's the georeference data for the stitched together image starting in the, on the bottom side and then the left side the top and then the right side of that image. Let's see, I need to make sure that I save that. Uh, oh, and one, one point again about that link right there. If I had messed up any of the screenshots that I took, I could have used this link to open the same map back up and use the arrow keys to navigate just to the screenshot that I needed to redo. Going back to the map, I could also click any one of these other buttons and also save that information as, as well. In the next video, I'm going to show you how to make KMZ files that include georeferenced images. KMZ files can be used for various things, including some cool 3D stuff that I will show you later in this video. So I'm going to click this last button here and get the KML syntax for each individual screenshot. So this doesn't require the screenshots to be stitched together. This will come up in the next video. So that data was copied to the clipboard. Go over to my editor. I'm going to open up a new file. I'm going to paste the information in here. And I'll talk about this in, again, the next, the next video. So let me save this. Save that, and we'll call this Mason Lake KML. Now back to the four screenshots I just took. The next step is to stitch those together into a single JPEG. Start by determining the size of the finished image. This will be exact multiples of the size of each JPEG screenshot. The screen is showing a few examples. My computer screen has a display resolution of 1280 wide by 1024 high. Since the screenshots are full size, the size of each JPEG is the same, 1280 wide by 1024 high. And since the JPEGs exactly adjoin, the dimensions of the final image must be exact multiples of the size of the individual JPEG. So multiply your JPEG width, 1280 in my case, by the number of screenshots you took going left to right, in the example I did it was two, so the width of the finished stitched together image I'm going to make will be 2560. And multiply your JPEG height, in my case 1024, by the number of screenshots you took going down. Again, I took two rows of screenshots, so the height of the finished image I'm going to make is going to be 2048. I now have Photoshop open on my screen. This is the last version of Photoshop that you could buy and not have to pay a subscription fee. You can also stitch images together using Windows 2D Paint program and a program to make panoramas called Huggin. I have the screen showing the main page for the Huggin program now and you can see the address for it right there. I have not used this program to stitch images together, but it is well regarded. Now back in Photoshop, I'm going to make a new empty image and give it a size of 
2560 wide by 2048 tall. Say OK. And now I'm going to go to where I save the JPEG screenshots that I took. And there are the four screenshots that I took. So I'm going to open the first JPEG, do select all, edit, copy, go to the large image that I'm making, edit, paste, activate the drag tool, and drag that into position. I know it goes in the upper left. Now you might not see this on the video, but as the JPEG gets close to the correct position, it seems to snap into place. Now I'll open up the second JPEG, open that, select all, edit, copy, go to the big JPEG that I'm making, edit, paste, and the drag tool is already active, so I can drag that one where it goes, just like that. Now I'm going to pause recording while I drag the other two JPEGs. And now I can save the stitched together image. So file, save as, going to save it as a JPEG. I'm going to rename it from that to Mason Lake. 2x2.jpg, save, and I'm going to give compression level 5, you see that right there, so we'll say OK. Compression level 5 still has plenty of detail in the image, and it will reduce the image size to about one-third of the uncompressed image. I'll open this up to full size in Photoshop here. This is what the full size image looks like after compression has been applied. Now compression does not change the dimensions of the final image. Those dimensions must be even multiples of the dimension of your JPEG, otherwise the georeferencing will be all screwed up. Oh, and just to show you that compression did not change the image size, we'll do image size and take a look, and sure enough, it's still 2560 by 2048. Next, I'm going to show you one of the ways to put your images online for free. An internet search will turn up various websites that provide free image hosting. I'm going to demonstrate using Flickr. If you use Flickr a bunch, you should really pay the modest fee for an account. But if you decide to use some other service, it has to meet the requirements you see on your screen. You must be able to access the image with a standard link that begins with HTTPS and ends with .jpg. If there's anything after .jpg, this is not going to work. The image size, the resolution, cannot be changed by the hosting service, and the hosting service should let you decide if you want any additional compression applied. Because if you already applied compression to your stitched together image, you probably don't want the hosting service to put additional compression on the image. The screen is now showing the main page for the Flickr website. I'm going to click on the menu icon in the upper left corner here and select Photo Stream. The screen, the screen will show the images that I have previously uploaded. I'm going to click the Upload icon, which is this little cloud thing with an arrow, and so I can upload my stitched together JPEG that I made. So I need to navigate to where that is. And here's the stitched together JPEG I made. I'm going to upload that to Flickr. And I'm going to click on Upload One Photo. Upload. Takes a little bit. Continue to Photo Stream. And this is the photo that I just uploaded right here. I'm going to click on that. And that photo appears. And I see some controls here now too. In the lower right corner, click the download symbol right here. I'm going to click that, and I'm going to highlight original. And notice the a size here, 2560, 2048. I'm going to right click the line for the original size, and I'm going to do copy link. Now I'm going back to my text editor, 
where I save the georeference data in the original link for this map and I'm going to po paste the link in there to save it. Here's my link for Flickr, https ensign.jpg. If I copy that link right there, copy, copy, paste that into a browser tab, paste, open that up, open with photos, okay, fine. I see the stitched together JPEG that I made. So my stitched together JPEG has been uploaded to Flickr and I've got the direct JPEG link for that image. Now it's time to do a quick test to make sure everything looks right and the image is correctly georeferenced. To do that, I'm going to make a GIS Surfer link that will display the stitched together image that is now hosted on Flickr. You're looking again at my editor and I have pasted in the default link to open the GIS Surfer map. I'm going to type a question mark, the data per parameter, and the data parameter is used to display information on the map. I'm going to give this a name, call it Mason Lake, and uh, type the caret symbol. Now I'm going to add the link to the JPEG. Copy that, paste that in there. Another caret symbol. You learned about the caret symbol if you watch some of the earlier GIS Surfer videos in this series. And last, I'm going to paste the georeference data in there so the JPEG can be correctly positioned on the map. I'm going to save that. Now I'm going to copy the GIS Surfer map link that I just made. Copy. Go to my browser, open a browser tab, paste that in there, paste Rooney, and the red outline is around the, let's see, fill that in, okay, the red outline is around the 2x2 two two grid of screenshots that I took. We can zoom in anywhere around the edge, see that the image is correctly georeferenced. There's a trail right there, uh, the streams all line up. There's a trail, old road lines up there. See if there's the uh, edge of some water. There's a freeway over on this side. So all, all the georeferencing looks just fine. See if I uh, go over and uh, look at an aerial in, instead. Well, look at that, there's the aerial showing the freeway and there's the freeway on the image that I made. After you make some georeferenced images, what good are they? Well, you could take your stitched together JPEG to a print shop copy shop and have them make a very large print. Uh, if you have a Garmin GPS unit, you could use the freeware KMZ factory to turn your stitched together JPEG into a map that you can display with your Garmin GPS. You could use your stitched together JPEG with the GeoJPEG software that I mentioned as an offline map. Or you could put your JPEG into a KMZ file for use with Google Earth Pro or the situational awareness Android app called ATAC with the GIS software, QGIS, and various other software as well. And speaking of KMZ files, the screen is now showing the related PDF tutorial I made. I'm going to show you something about KMZ files that I think is greatly entertaining. By the way, instructions for making KMZ files that include one or more geo-referenced images are at page 7 in this PDF. And I'm planning to do another video on the topic of making KMZ files that include images like we've been talking about. But let's look at page 16 here, which shows some large geo-referenced JPEGs that I have made that anyone can use. Uh, you might know that I live in the greater Seattle area, so I have made stitched together JPEGs that cover much of the Washington State Cascades. And here, here's an index map to those. And if you scroll down, then here are links that will open each one of those maps with GIS Surfer and also has a link to a KMZ file for each one as well. And I'm going to show a demonstration using this map here for I-90 west of Snoqualmie Pass. But first I'm going to open up the GIS Surfer map link and show you something. 
If you wanted to get the address for this JPEG and its georeference data, here's how you do that. You click Menu, Link to this map. I'm going to expand that edit window there. And here we see the address for that JPEG hosted on my server and followed by the georeference data for that JPEG. So if you wanted to use that JPEG with the georeference data, that's how you find it. I'm going to do something with that KMZ file, but I'm going to do it by starting up Google Earth Pro. And I'm going to open up a KMZ file. And here's my KMZ file for I-90 west of Snoqualmie Pass. I'm going to open that up. It will take a few seconds to load. We'll zoom in when it gets there. Now, notice these two controls over here. These will let you do lots of fun things. We'll tilt the map a little bit more with this one. We'll zoom in a little bit. And now we'll start to fly around a little bit in 3D. And you can see what happens as we do this. We really have a 3D aspect for the map. We can kind of go down here a little bit, come back around, go up here, look down behind that ridge, look over there, look over here, go over there, come back around this way. I think this is just super, super cool. Or we could tilt that a little bit more. Uh, we could spin around, spin around a little slower. Take a 3D view. Let's go in a little bit more. Let's see, maybe we'll go over here. We'll stand close to this peak. There, now, now we'll, we'll spin around from there. And you really get this 3D appearance. You can waste a lot of time doing this. <laughs> well, I, I, I hope you enjoyed that. So you can make your own custom stitched together JPEGs, put them in a KMZ file, fly around with Google Earth Pro like I just did a little bit, and use up all kinds of time doing that. This is the end of the video showing you how to use GIS Server to make your own custom JPEG images that are automatically georeferenced and show almost anything that GIS Surfer can display. In addition to this video, there is also a PDF file with step-by-step -step instructions for using screenshot mode. You can find that PDF file, as well as others, by going to the GIS Surfer homepage, gissurfer.com, click the big green menu button, and go to the help page. You can always find my contact information and links to my various projects by visiting the Mapping Support Project page, mappingsupport.com. Thanks for watching. I hope you find GIS Server to be useful.